Okay, great. So, so yeah, so I'm going to give, you know, a different kind of talk here than maybe you've seen me give at uh, most conferences. I'm not going to talk about Apache Spark or new open source projects or anything uh, like that, that uh, we're developing uh, to help uh, people do data processing. I'm actually going to talk about building the Databricks uh, service itself and some of the lessons we learned from that. Um, and today, uh, Databricks, you know, because it runs uh, large scale workloads on behalf of uh, enterprise customers, it's actually operating at a very high scale. I I'm, wouldn't be surprised actually if we manage more VMs uh, than any other private company at the moment, uh, because all the workloads that people run on Databricks are large scale. And, uh, you know, we, we launch and manage these VMs on uh, public clouds on behalf of our customers. So we had to learn a lot of things to do this and, uh, you know, carefully design everything that we're building to support these kinds of workloads. And I think there are, you know, maybe interesting uh, lessons for everyone looking uh, into scaling services and in general into designing their systems uh, so that they scale well. And on top of that, a lot of what we do is using Scala as well. So you can see some, uh, some cool ways that we're using it. Um, so this is a talk about, you know, with really work that's happening across our whole engineering team. These are some of the folks that I actually work on, uh, or at least lead a lot of the platform teams uh, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but it's really a major part of what the whole company does. Uh, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the Databricks sort of um, service itself, what it provides to give you a sense of what it is and maybe what's uh, challenging about supporting that. Um, next, I'm going to talk about uh, the specific challenges in developing a large scale cloud service like this for, you know, enterprise B2B customers to use. And finally, I'm going to drill into four lessons from our experience, uh, which go, uh, you know, from how to build the service to how to test it to actually things that we are doing uh, in Spark and big data processing technology to make it work better in the cloud based on, you know, lessons we learned from what, what um, uh, issues customers ran into. Okay, so I'll start with the first one. Um, so uh, Databricks uh, itself is, uh, uh, you know, is a startup company founded in 2013 um, by the Apache Spark Research Group at UC Berkeley. So the group that, uh, you know, initially uh, created the project. And, uh, you know, as the open source project was taking off, we really wanted to continue building it. And we also thought, you know, you, you need more than just this open source engine to actually uh, enable uh, lots of uh, companies and lots of users to do things with uh, data. Uh, and we decided that a cloud service was actually the best bet uh, to really make this accessible to the broadest um, audience possible. So we started building uh, you know, a, a cloud-based uh, data and machine learning platform uh, on top of public clouds. Um, and today it's grown uh, to about 7,000 uh, customers uh, across AWS and Azure and also pretty large scale of the workloads. We're running millions of VMs, as I said, processing uh, exabytes of data each day. And there are also hundreds of thousands of users on the platform, which are the data scientists and engineers and so on. And our company is grown as well, but it's actually, you know, it's not that large given the scale of what we're doing. Um, we have uh, about um, 1,500 employees, 300 engineers, um, and uh, 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 we just announced um, that last quarter we, we crossed 350 million in ARR. So if you look at it, you know, for each engineer, there are basically uh, tens of thousands of um, VMs running workloads in there that have to keep working well or else the engineer will get paged. Okay, so what, what is the product itself? What do customers do and what do they expect out of it? Um, so basically, our users are uh, professionals working with data. It could be data scientists, data engineers, or business users who are using things like dashboards or uh, BI tools. And we have a cloud hosted, you know, data platform, the, the kind of data platform you might you know, consider building yourself in, in your company. Um, and it's, it's, it includes a bunch of services. So it includes a data science workspace for interactive queries with uh, notebooks. And it's all, that's all a collaborative service where many users can work together. Uh, it includes uh, SQL analytics. This is actually a new uh, product that we just launched today, which is basically a SQL focused uh, workspace based on the open source uh, Redash project. Um, and it's designed for data analysts to use. It also lets you connect with uh, tools like Tableau and Click and, and so on. 
Um, it also includes a job scheduler. This is a huge driver of the workload because uh, every time you build some useful analysis, you probably want to turn it into a production job. Uh, and then you expect that to work reliably. And it also includes other things like machine learning platform features, uh, data catalog, uh, security, and so on. So the key thing though, is that um, um, uh, all of the workloads running on this are usually uh, working with large amounts of data. So they're each parallel. Um, and uh, so, so we have to scale in that direction. You have to make sure that we provide a SQL service or data science uh, you know, notebook experience or whatever that, that uh, works with large scale. And also a huge amount of the workloads are production workloads. You know, If you do something successful, like you design a machine learning model or you design uh, you know, a data pipeline that's going to load and process your data, you want that to keep running. And so reliability is, is extremely important uh, even as the data sizes go over time and so on. Uh, ideally, you know, these users would be, be able to set up a pipeline and then forget about it and you know, never have to go back and deal with errors in that or anything like that. So that's kind of, th those are the services that the users see. Now under the hood, where do all the workloads run? So actually we uh, set things up so that the workloads run in the customer's own cloud account. So basically the customer just gives us uh, an IAM role for launching uh, instances in the account and, and accessing you know, parts of their storage bucket. Uh, and then we just, we deploy um, clusters in there. We have a software on it called, on the clusters called Databricks Runtime and it directly accesses their storage. So the, the nice thing about about this is that customers own all the storage and also if the customer has you know a special virtual network they want things to run on or um, you know they have a, a special discount or reserved instances or whatever with the cloud provider um, they can benefit from all those you know as, as uh, we run the workload over there. Um, and in terms of what we actually run, most of the uh, stuff uh, we, we run uh, on the clusters is based on open source. Um, so of course, Apache Spark, lots of other open source data and ML um, products. And in fact, since we started the company, we actually launched two new uh, widely used open source projects, uh, Delta Lake for storage management and ML flow for a machine learning platform. So, uh, you know, even though there's all this talk about like, well, the, the cloud providers, are, are they just going to, to take, you know, to, to, to use your open source project um, uh, and compete with you? Um, uh, we actually thought that it's, it's very important to uh, launch some of these things so that they can be standard in the community uh, and, uh, and really uh, have, a, you know, basically um, a, a benefit from the openness uh, that you get using that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, in both our services and the, the runtime, we use uh, Scala uh, you know, pretty heavily. Actually, uh, we only just recently launched uh, basically our first uh, non-Scala service uh, uh, to run Redash because Redash is a Python application, but pretty much everything else uh, is Scala. So we have a lot of interesting experience about just managing you know, large Scala projects and testing and upgrading uh, and all that stuff as well, if you, uh, you, know, if you wanna hear about that. Okay. Uh, how, how do people use it? So these are just some examples, you know, kind of the sales slide with the wall of uh, logos who are using um, uh, the, the product. And, uh, you know, the, the key point though is that companies in all industries are actually working with uh, very large data sets these days for, for pretty important internal use cases. Um, so it's not, it's definitely not just tech companies who need these anymore. Um, and just to give you a, a few representative examples, uh, first of all, health and life science is one of the biggest areas uh, where, where people are collecting and working with large data sets. Um, you know, one, one use case uh, we, we have at Regeneron, for example, um, is correlating uh, patient records from um, half a million patients with their DNA. So the DNA is, you know, many, uh, you know, potentially gigabytes of data per patient. Um, and they want to correlate these together to design therapies that are tailored to your genome. Um, and, you know, maybe a drug that works on some people uh, uh, and doesn't work on others, maybe you can figure out when that will happen based on the genome. Uh, 
Um, so this in itself is a is a you know very large use case. Um, another one is large industrial companies. So companies like Shell and others have instrumented you know pretty much every uh, you know every um, uh, machine in a in a in a factory or in a chemical plant or whatever uh, to produce you know really detailed data about how it's operating uh, and what kind of um, inventory is in there and so on. So they're using they run large scale simulations, machine learning, and just basically large scale analytics to optimize that whole process. Um, and then uh, another cool use case I wanted to call out is, is FINRA, which is in the US is the financial industry regulatory um, authority. Uh, so basically their job is to look at all the trades that happen on um, stock markets, securities markets in the US and find, um, uh, find basically illegal trading. Um, and so they have 30 petabytes of data uh, and growing uh, uh, with all those trades. And they're looking uh, in that for various patterns uh, using machine learning to, to, you know, to find people who are um, uh, you know, doing illegal things like insider trading. So these are just some, you know, example of, you know, what, what people will do with big data outside of uh, kind of a tech company. Okay. And because of, uh, you know, the, the usage, um, uh, because of the scale of these and because of the fact that each application also tends to grow over time as you collect, you know, more data at higher fidelity, uh, we also have to deal with very large usage of our platform. So this plot here is showing the number of virtual machines were running each day over the past um, uh, uh, three years. And you can see it's been growing uh, at about a factor of three per year, actually. In fact, even uh, this year with COVID and, and all that. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this is a combination of, of course, uh, bringing in new customers, but also existing customers and existing workloads growing over time. So we have to make sure that everything we build works with these. And, uh, you know, these days, even new customers you bring on will already have maybe petabytes of data somewhere and will want to run on that. So they'll bring in a large uh, chunk of workload. Um, uh, just just by coming onto the platform. So what's challenging about all this, about building this? So there are basically two challenges and we have to think about both of them because uh, they come together in our product. So the first one is all the challenges of building business to business cloud services. When you build something that another company is going to rely on, uh, it needs to be highly available. Uh, it needs to be secure. Um, uh, it, uh, if, if you have any component that's shared uh, that you know has information about multiple customers that needs to isolate them from each other. So it needs to be multi-tenant. Um, and also you need to be able to update it and push changes and do maintenance without breaking the workloads. It's especially important uh, because as I said, a lot of our workloads are these production pipelines where you know, as the user, you hope that you set it up once and then you never have to worry about it and it'll keep working and producing that report or that uh, model or whatever it is uh, that, uh, you know, that your um, uh, business uh, depends on. So that is, is challenging you know, in itself, whether you're uh, building uh, Databricks or you're just uh, building you know, like an email or a spreadsheet or whatever issue tracker uh, for uh, you know, other businesses to use. Uh, but then of course on our side, um, we also have the challenges of large scale data processing. All these workloads are large scale. And if you think of all you know, the, the work you have to do maybe to, to keep uh, a data pipeline and the software for it running you know, inside just one company wherever you work, uh, you know, imagine having to do that for 7,000 companies. Um, so obviously everything uh, has to be um, you know, as resilient as possible without human intervention. And when there is human intervention, it has to be very easy to fix uh, and to, to understand what's going on. Um, so that's, that's kind of the second challenge that we have to deal with. So I'll talk about both of them uh, later on to, to show you ways that we've, uh, you know, we've, we've dealt with some of them. So let me start, let me explain these in a little bit more detail. I'll start with just the cloud one to explain what's hard there. So I think everyone, you know, maybe um, probably knows this, but um, um, uh, basically developing software and selling software in the cloud is quite different from the traditional model. Uh, traditionally, you know, before the cloud, uh, software was sold, you know, using these packaged releases. And basically you would work, a team would work on something like, let's say the next generation of Oracle database or whatever, or Windows or something like that. 
um, and you you would you know you would make releases anywhere from every six months to every few years, and so they would work on it, test it, package it into a release, and then the customers would be responsible for operating it. So they just get a bunch of bits on a on a CD-ROM. Maybe they get a support contract, but they uh, they have to install it and manage it and, and operate it. Um, with the cloud software, uh, the vendor does the operations for them. That's basically the difference. It means you can release updates a lot faster. You, usually, you know, you'll release every one or two weeks. Uh, sometimes, maybe even every day, depending how you how you set up your infrastructure. Um, and uh, it also means that your customers need uh, fewer, uh, basically uh, less operations work to support the same number of users. So they can bring more users on the platform um, and, or you know, they can spend their time doing more interesting things. Um, but it also means that you take on this responsibility. So from the customer's perspective, if everything is working well, uh, they expect to get a number of uh, benefits from the cloud software. Uh, most importantly, they expect uh, you, you, the cloud vendor, to do all the management. And this is something that's really valuable. This is one of the reasons that cloud services uh, uh, you know, will you know may may, may cost more uh, uh, than uh, and may may command higher revenue and higher margins and so on uh, uh, than um, you know than just selling someone some some bits uh, because basically uh, the, a lot of the value is the security, high availability, and so on out of the management. Um, they might also, they, they, they generally will expect elasticity as well. Everything should be pay as you go. They should be able to bring in workloads just on demand. And, uh, you know, when you bring in a new workload, it should, it should always work. Um, and the other thing that they usually expect, because um, it's in the cloud and you can release updates anytime, you, uh, you will get new features released faster. You can give a team feedback and get a bug fixed or get a, you know, a new feature launched within uh, a few weeks maybe, uh, because you know, they can update your software anytime. So these are, these are what the customers um, expect. Uh, and obviously they're, they're valuable and it's great to build a product that has these properties. Um, but building them and actually delivering on those uh, is also hard. Um, there are you know, ma many issues you have to deal with and uh, that you wouldn't have in traditional package software. Um, and so for example, um, uh, one, one of the top ones is, is building a multi-tenant service. How do you design you know, the, the control plane on the cloud provider side uh, to scale well with lots of customers to provide strong security by construction so nothing can go wrong and you know show information to the wrong person, and also to to isolate the customers from each other in terms of performance and faults and so on. For an on-premise software or even an open source project like Apache Spark, uh, you don't have to worry about this because you just provide one instance of the software and your user manages it. But for here, you have to worry about not not how I how do I provide like you know one instance of Apache Spark or of a database, but how do I let anyone spin one up and make sure they don't interfere with each other in any way. Um, second challenge is of course operating the service. Um, security, availability, monitoring, and so on. So you have to take that on as a cloud software provider. Uh, uh, although arguably, you know, it's, uh, the outcome is hopefully better than if, if you asked each customer to do it on their own because you'd be better at it from doing a lot of it. Um, and then the third one is, uh, is, is upgrading without regression. So, um, you know, unlike uh, something where you, you tell your customer, you know, please update to the next version of this and they can roll it out over you know, a couple of years, they can even keep critical workloads back. Um, in the cloud, you're trying to have one instance of the software that you're continuously updating. Um, and um, uh, it's critical for this to work, to always work and to not regress. Um, uh, because otherwise users are not going to trust your cloud. And so this includes everything from the API to the, um, the semantics of different operations to performance regressions and so on. Uh, whenever you make a release, if any of these things are you know, getting worse, you have to be able to undo the release and, and fix these issues. Um, and it's, it's a lot more work, but of course it leads to a product that evolves faster and you know gives the users better features faster. So it's really important to figure out how to do this well if you want to compete with other cloud services, for example. Okay.
And of course, on top of the challenges of cloud, uh, the, the challenges of large scale, which you know, people are, are probably all familiar with here. So uh, each individual app needs to deal with failures and stragglers and all that stuff. Um, uh, also, uh, an interesting one uh, you know, that we've seen is each customer app, you know, if it starts making a lot of calls uh, into the control plane, it could certainly overload the services that we're providing. Uh, so you need to guard against that. You know, imagine a Spark job that launches, you know, 10,000 tasks that are each trying to, you know, to change permissions on something in, in the workspace or whatever it is they're trying to do. Um, and the other one uh, is, of course, the weird failure modes that you only see, you know, happens one in a million times, but it means you're going to see it when you have, you know, a few million VMs. Okay. So that's uh, kind of just an overview uh, of the, the kind of things uh, that are challenging. I hope it's given you a sense of what the, you know, what the customers expect and what you know, we hope to deliver and why it's hard. Um, so next I wanna dive more deeply into, into four you know, interesting things we learned uh, you know, based on our experience uh, and some of the things that we're doing in response to them. And you know, some, hopefully you know, a bunch of these uh, will apply or at least they'll be insightful for uh, things you might be working on as well, whether you are working on uh, large scale data processing or building a cloud service or something else. So I'll talk, I'll talk about what actually goes on you know, in, in cloud services in our operational experience. Um, how to test for scalability and stability. The stuff that I, I mentioned is, um, can, can be quite hard to, uh, uh, to guarantee. Um, how to develop control planes. So this is our service framework and infrastructure for that. And finally, a bit about evolving big data systems themselves to work well in the cloud and to work well you know, when you have to manage uh, 7,000 or you know, maybe uh, even more uh, instances of them uh, for each of the workloads. So this includes some open source uh, uh, work that we're doing uh, in the Delta Lake project. So let me start with this one. So a, a lot of things you know you might imagine could go wrong uh, in building this kind of application, and we're always uh, keeping track of like what if, you know if anything is causing problems. Um, so, uh, but but in our experience, there are actually some uh, very common themes that come up. Um, so to give you a sense, this is a plot of some of the uh, some of the issues that cause significant outages uh, for us at Databricks over uh, a three month uh, period last year, uh, basically. Um, and um, uh, by significant outages, I mean something that took down uh, production workloads for customers. So th this would be things like scheduled jobs and so on. Because um, that's the thing, you know, if, if those go down, of course, they'll be retried and so on later, but it, it means that they might not deliver their results on time and it, you know, it costs money and so on. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm counting here. So you can see the number of causes and a lot of them have to do with scaling. The, uh, you, you know, the top ones were a scaling problem in some of our services where they couldn't cope with some dimension of the load coming in or scaling problems interestingly in the underlying cloud provider services that we rely on, which are things like the uh, cluster manager uh, that gives you VMs when you request a VM from the cloud provider or the virtual network uh, or sometimes storage. Uh, so interestingly, some of those can have issues too. Um, another common uh, one was insufficient user isolation. So you, what I mentioned before, you've got one user that's making an unusual uh, kind of pattern of calls and uh, that uh, causes something to tip over and it affects other users. Um, and then deployment misconfiguration uh, and other, a lot of the ones that other have to do with regressions that we couldn't uh, find during testing, but there's other stuff in there as well. Um, so you can see that at least 70% of them are scale related. If you were providing just some kind of package software that uh, someone installs and operates on their own, uh, they wouldn't really have uh, any of these issues. Uh, but of course, you know, we want to provide something better where, you know, we will manage it and give you, you know, best in class um, availability for, for those workloads. So here are just some uh, concrete examples of the issues. Um, and uh, I'll also give uh, you know, a more detailed one later to, to show how different things can interact. So cloud networks are actually um, you know, a, a, a common 
um, uh, source of issues, depending on how you're configuring things. Because uh, these are, you know, even though these are virtual networks, there are a whole bunch of limits in there. For example, how many entries can be in a routing table, you know, how, 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 uh, how quickly can a machine talk to thousands of other machines and so on. Uh, and also some, and some of the, the failure behaviors that you get there can be quite weird, where, for example, packets are flowing one way, but not another way. Um, automated apps creating large load. I mentioned this, you know, you, you let people call something, uh, you know, on thousands of machines and place a load against your system, it you better be able to, to handle that. Um, very large requests and results and so on. We've seen everything from, you know, the SQL query that's, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, many like uh, hundreds of thousands of characters long to the single uh, individual record in your parquet table that's, you know, gigabytes in size. So all, all these things, you know, uh, all the assumptions you might have about sizes of things it will, will probably be blown away. Um, um, and, um, uh, uh, slow VM launches and shutdowns and lack of VM capacity um, from, you know, as I said, this cluster manager inside each cloud provider, uh, and even things like data corruption writing uh, the cloud storage. So all these kind of things can happen. Uh, oh, I see some questions in the chat. Um, uh, can you talk about the other 20% outages? I, I will talk about some more of them um, later. I think I, maybe a question, I, I did mention a few things. Uh, and then Eric asked, is Databricks AWS GovCloud certified? Uh, yes, it, it is available on GovCloud. And um, that's actually another thing I didn't go into too much in this talk, but I'll, I'll go to it later, which is how do you design, you know, the same infrastructure to work well on many clouds and across sort of constrained environments like GovCloud? That's, a, that's an interesting one as well. Yeah. So these are, you know, so these are just some examples of the issues. Um, I'll give you one concrete example of an outage because it, it, it shows a few of the things that can happen um, and why it's kind of hard to, to, to do some of these things. Uh, so I'll start by, so, so this, this was uh, a problem involving our job service in one region. Um, so the job service is something that um, launches and tracks uh, jobs on clusters uh, on a schedule. So you say, for example, run the Spark job, you know, every two hours to ingest some data and, you know, convert it to a different format or compute or report or, or whatever it is. Um, so the job service is, is sitting in our control plane, let's say an AWS account or Azure account or whatever, and then it's, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, launching these clusters uh, and it's communicating to them to see how the job is going you know is it is it still alive what's it doing and so on and these are in the cloud in, in the customers network okay so it, it turned out in this region there was one customer that decided to run many jobs per second on the same cluster actually it's kind of a funny story so this this customer set up essentially a lambda function um, and they set it up so that whenever they upload a file in a, in a specific bucket, uh, they are going to, to send a command to our job service and on a job to process that file. So that's actually awesome. You know, we, we love that people are automating the workloads using Lambda and it's easy to do that, like that's great. Um, but, um, you know, no one had done it at quite this speed before. And actually what this custom, what this, you know, user did is um, they, they set up that Lambda function and then they uploaded, you know, a million files into that bucket um, all at once. And so you had this Lambda function that was submitting lots of jobs per second. Uh, many of the jobs were super short and suddenly this one instance of the service had to deal with, you know, very high load coming from this one customer. Okay. So now, you know, the high load, like, you know, and maybe it's okay to, to deal with it. You can have a queue of requests, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, but it turns out that actually one of the limits we hit was a little bit earlier than that. Um, so the job service is sitting there uh, trying to launch jobs, um, but it turns out that actually the, the network, the virtual network in this cloud provider had a limit of a thousand connections per virtual machine uh, between different virtual networks. So between our control plane and the customer's uh, VPC basically. Um, and, uh, and that's because, you know, it is a virtual network and there are elements in there that have little limited memory and so on. And after this new limit, if you try 
to send um, if you try to open a TCP connection to you know to something in a different uh, network, um, those packets are just silently dropped. So uh, you don't get a reset packet back or anything like that. You send the TCP SYN packets to open the connection, and you never hear back. You don't even hear like, "Hey, th this this connection is blocked by by the network in some way." Um, so these are going to hang. So so why is that a problem? So so as the job service is sending commands to, to kick off these jobs, uh, it opened you know, many connections to, you know, within that network to run these things. Um, and eventually this VM, the job service VM had too many connections. It reached this limit of a thousand connections going on to this customer network. So now the, the, the problem is now, normally when you open, you know, uh, uh, you try to open a TCP connection to somewhere and you can't connect, um, uh, th it will fail quickly, basically. Um, uh, but uh, in this case, you know, we, we just sent the SYN packet and we, we never heard anything back. So there's a pretty large timeout uh, in Linux until we decide to give up on the connection. So now all these connections past the thousand that were, uh, you know, that, you know, that were, being created on this job service for each connection, there was also memory pressure because we had some information in memory. We, we thought we we're ready to start that job. So we had some state about it, you know, which commands should be executed and so on. Uh, and these were all in memory in this job service. And this was causing uh, memory pressure and garbage collection and slowing things down even more. And the final thing that happened is, um, so, okay, these new jobs are not running. That's you know that's not the end of the world because we, we didn't tell the customer that they run and it, you know it's expected that it would be a little slower but the interesting thing that happened is the the memory pressure and gc uh actually caused uh other jobs it caused the health checks to some other jobs uh in this instance to time out um so that means so you know as we're monitoring the jobs from other customers that should be running we occasionally ping them and we ask, hey, you know, are you still alive? What's going on? And they, they reply back. And if we don't hear back, you know, within some basically like, you know, tens of minutes, um, then we're going to assume that they've, uh, uh, they've hung and we actually abort them and shut down that cluster because we don't want them to waste time having these VMs running that are doing nothing. Um, and so in this case, because the service itself was doing GC, some of those health jerks timed out on, just because the job service was uh, doing extensive garbage collection. And so we aborted some perfectly fine jobs that were running for other customers that you know, were, were working just fine, but our service thought that they were hanging. So, and, and so we, 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 when the service woke up, it sent them a message saying, you know, please shut down and they actually shut down. So it's a pretty, you know, interesting um, uh, kind of situation because you, you can see, okay, there are scaling things involved, but it's not something as simple as like, you know, I was doing a join in a database and it became slow when I had too much data. Um, and, and in fact, the resources that ran out were all a little bit strange. There was this, this resource here uh, with the connections um, in the virtual network. And then that caused some other re resource, the memory pressure to build up. And you know, the GC was actually freeing memory and stuff. Like we didn't completely run out of memory, uh, but it caused uh, some assumptions about how long things will take to, to go wrong. Uh, and we, we ended up canceling someone's, uh, someone's jobs basically. So that's, you know, it's, it's an example of what happens. Um, so I'll talk a lot about how to test for and prevent uh, issues uh, like this by design, ideally. Um, there are also some surprisingly rare issues that happened where, you know, when we started, I would have thought these will happen more, but they uh, didn't. Um, so, you know, um, uh, one thing, uh, it, th there's only one instance, I think, since the company existed that a cloud provider said, uh, you, we're going to restart all your VMs to patch a hypervisor. This was a uh, patch to Zen on AWS a few years ago. And I think now uh, pretty much all of them can do this uh, without shutting down uh, customer VMs at all. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, we had one instance uh, where uh, there was a misreported security scan on a customer VM. So customers you know, run various software to look for potential problems and their software said, you have a virus or you have malware or something on this Databricks VM. And of course we're 
uh, going to be very concerned about that because we certainly hope that uh, there wasn't anything on our side that that caused that to happen. Um, turned out to be misreported, so that was good. But that's a scary event where you have to, uh, you know, look at a lot of logs and and see what happened and and, and understand the situation. Um, there was one really big S3 outage that caused. Uh, the, the thing that I would consider a significant outage where jobs are failing, you know, there are smaller ones that degrade performance, but nothing, uh, only one really large one. And I think there have been only kind of two Linux kernel bugs that were um, uh, big issues. And actually both of them were related to TCP. They led to hung connections in situations when they shouldn't have hung, like the one I described before. Uh, cool. I see one question about this. Uh, uh, um, so about, from Nicholas about data corruption. Uh, we've been using Git and LFS to ensure uh, a storage system um, and give uh, high confidence against corruption because of Git. Is this a, wide use, a wise use of Git plus LFS? I do think, yeah, I do think that Git helps uh, because it's doing uh, additional hashing uh, of the data and it should be easy to tell when something is wrong. So that helps. Uh, yeah, we definitely use a lot of checksums and uh, on just on the, the customer's data to, to deal with uh, these issues. And sometimes there are issues in the in the cloud storage. It's not super common, but again, with a large data set, it, it, it could happen eventually. Um, yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Cool, okay, so yeah, this hopefully this gives you a sense of the kind of things that can go on. So basically one takeaway here is that, um, you know, the load in your cloud service is going to vary on many dimensions, even weird dimensions, like how many uh, network connections can you have to somewhere? Uh, and also like, you know, how, how many people are submitting very tiny jobs, at, uh, you know, each second and so on. Um, and also these services rely on other services with different limits and failure modes. Um, and these problems, I think, will, uh, if you're not careful, they'll just get worse as you build, you know, more and more services that rely on each other, uh, especially across vendors, but even within one company, because, uh, you know, all the things you rely on can have these, uh, these kind of issues. So, for example, with stuff like now, you know, each time we we build something, we, we think about, you know, each API that we call, what if that just hangs out forever? That's one of the dimensions that we'll uh, test against uh, because we don't, uh, don't want to end up consuming resources because another service is being slow. So these are the, the kind of things that, that would go on. Okay, so I told you what can go on, but how do you fix it? So next thing I want to talk about is uh, testing uh, and then engineering to, to handle these things. So the, I'll start with the testing method that we developed. This is actually something I worked on early on at Databricks that like really helped to improve things. It's not the only way to do uh, testing, but it's uh, I thought it's a pretty cool way to think about it. Um, so if you go back to first principle, okay, let's say you want to test the system to prevent outages like the one I talked about. Um, so testing for scalability and stability is quite different from just testing for correctness of, like, of your code. Usually, if you think about correctness, it's a Boolean property. Does your software give the right output on this input or not? It's, it's easy to check for, you know, as long as you can think of all the inputs you want to test, you can just check if it's right. In contrast, scalability and stability are both matters of degree. For any software I build, there will be some load where it's going to fail, um, you know, if it has limited resources. So it is going to fail at some point. And the question is just at what level and is, uh, is that level acceptable for you? Um, and then the other thing is, okay, when it stops being able to take on new load, what failure behavior does it have? There are some bad ones and there are some good ones. A uh, bad one, maybe the worst one would be to crash everyone who's using it so far, like just, you know, give up and shut down. That would be really bad. Um, uh, another example would be to, uh, to drop um, some of the users. Now that is, you know, not uh, ideal. That's, for example, something that happened in the jobs outage I mentioned, a few jobs were canceled, but it's also not as bad as the first one. Uh, and then maybe the ideal one is to stop accepting a new load and give a nice error message uh, and, um, you know, but, but still continue running all, all the stuff from, uh, from other uh, customers who are not uh, placing very high load. Okay, so 
just a, as an example uh, of the kind of issues that can happen, you know, these scalability problems can happen anywhere in your software stack. So, um, so one of the earliest things we launched was our data science, you know, notebooks. And um, you, you, you think it's not, you know, there's not much that can go wrong there. You just take something like Jupyter, you know, host it in a, in a container and uh, run a Spark cluster on the other end and let people send the commands through. Um, so it seems pretty easy. But actually, it turns out that all these components on the path from the user to the browser to our servers uh, and finally to the app that actually launches the Spark commands could have problems. Uh, so one example problem is if you have a large result set, you know, your Spark job is collecting data, but it decided to collect, uh, you know, like hundreds of gigabytes of data into the driver program. Um, uh, or, uh, you know, maybe the data got collected into Spark, but now you're sending it to the web browser. Um, all of these components along the way could crash in that case. And of course, users on our platform do want to work with large data sets. They do want to send back, you know, as much data as possible to their browser to visualize it. And uh, they also want to maybe download the rest as a big file or something. Um, so all these components would crash because of that. Uh, another interesting dimension was a large record in a file. So uh, inside Spark, you know, do we assume that each record uh, fits, uh, for example, in a byte array in Java? Well, a byte array is only uh, 2 billion bytes, 2 gigabytes. Some, some uh, customers had, you know, individual records that were larger than that. Um, so, or, or do you assume that you can fit, you know, at least whatever, like 100 records in memory at a time? Sometimes you can't. Um, Another interesting one is large number of tasks. If you run a job on you know, millions of files and it launches a task for each file, then the scheduler and the, the UI that shows you the progress of your job and all these things could have issues visualizing that. Um, and finally, um, if someone sends a command that freezes one of the workers, uh, how do the other components respond? Do they realize that it's gone and, and, and not do stuff on there? And of course, there are also other users using the same cluster uh, and using the same notebook and so on. So, uh, so all these will affect other users as well. Okay, so now I, I, maybe I've scared you like a lot of different things can go wrong. How, how in the world are you gonna test for them? And certainly when we started offering this product to real customers very quickly, you know, we would have new issues each week that we'd never seen before. And it was kind of a game of whack-a-mole where you fix one and then other things uh, uh, will start breaking. Um, and you know you just have to deal with these, these kind of scalability limits all the time. Um, so we actually designed this stress test infrastructure to, to handle this. And um, it's got a few, um, it's got a very simple process. So first of all, you identify dimensions that you wanna scale the system in, like number of users, number of output rows in a query, size of each row, latency of an RPC to one of your uh, dependent services and so on. So you just list them out. What are all the dimensions that might go? Easy to do that. Uh, and then we just go the load in each dimension until a failure occurs. And it turns out that actually testing each dimension by itself is, off, is enough to, to find the bottlenecks and the bad failure behaviors. And in most cases, you don't need to think about combinations that often because even one dimension will push on that particular load. So that uh, is one of the kind of surprising maybe insights for us, uh, but that actually makes it tractable to test. You don't have to think about each combination or even about what's the right mix that exactly matches a customer workload. If you just stress each one by itself, you are going to find most problems. Um, next thing we do is once you've pushed each dimension and, and got the thing to break, uh, record the failure type and the impact. Was there a good error message? Was there a timeout? Was it the wrong result? Um, uh, are other clients affected? And did the system recover automatically eventually or not? Uh, and then finally, you just compare this over time and whenever you make a change to your software. So a very simple approach, but it actually caught, uh, you know, a huge amount of the bad behaviors. And once we did this, you know, we went from many new issues each week to pretty much no issues about stability in, uh, you know, in this part of the product. Um, and so we, we just ran this automatically and we had this, uh, you know, this, uh, this spreadsheet, it's more sophisticated now, but basically uh, that showed you for each test, we had all these suites, we had these individual tests that we're trying to, to do. And for each one, we recorded the maximum value that it worked on and the state after, and uh, we could compare these over time. And if you see in the states, the failed state is actually green. Failed means 
it gave a good error message and it said, I can't do this. And that's actually good. We, we want, that is gonna happen at some point, uh, but states like timed out, for example, are bad. Uh, if, if something times out, that's a bad experience for the user. And some of these flags here also show the, the ones with red flags mean that it also affected other users on the cluster or even it, you know, it broke the web application in front of it or something like that. Um, so that's um, so that's what it looks like. So easy and uh, it's quite straightforward to test the class versions using this approach. Um, the next thing I'll talk about briefly is designing control planes. Um, so there are a lot of talks about this. Um, um, I'm not going to say too much, but um, uh, you know, obviously, like uh, even within our service, we have a lot of uh, smaller services that interact with each other, and there's a lot of debate. I think there's a panel at this conference about the right programming model, the scale of the services, how they should talk, and so on. Um, so we uh, built an uh, internal service framework that handles a lot of these. And I just wanted to show some of the technologies we're using. Uh, on top of the service framework, we also use Databricks itself uh, extensively for monitoring uh, and uh, data analytics on what's happening. But basically using the stuff in here, and in particular using a lot of uh, Scala and Kubernetes, uh, we can do cross cloud deployments, special environments like GovCloud. Um, and we also manage storage in a consistent way everywhere. Uh, security tokens, roles, monitoring, uh, API limits and routing, and uh, very importantly, feature flagging. So we can roll out changes to just a few customers and hold them back if we, uh, if we need to. Um, so just some best practices we learned just kind of quickly. Um, so the first one, uh, so as we build a new service, you know, what do we think about? The first one is to really isolate the state and make sure you have a great handle on where that is because that's the thing that you can't mess up. And actually for us, we found that just a um, relational database was usually enough for our control plane state with maybe some sharding for organization. And it kind of makes sense because, you know, we, we don't have like big metadata basically about, um, you know, like how many notebooks you have and stuff like that. So for, for our case, it makes sense. Of course, if you're building something with billions of users, you, you have to do something different there. Um, second interesting one is to isolate components that scale differently. I'll show a picture of this, but one issue with the jobs outage I mentioned before is that there was a single um, service that was responsible for monitoring the already running jobs and for um, you know scheduling and launching new jobs. And when there was high load on that second part, the scheduling and launching, then the first part suffered. So one way to, to prevent that structurally is to actually have different services that do these different parts. And then even if you stop accepting jobs for a while, you'll still be able to monitor existing ones. Um, Manage changes to feature flags. We tried a lot of ways and there's no such thing as a change that is always safe and never needs to be rolled back. Uh, you want uh, a feature flag for everything. So that's, that's what we're doing. And you, you may have to turn that off uh, in, the, in the future. Um, uh, watch key metrics. So uh, another interesting thing we found is uh, most outages could be predicted using just very simple machine level metrics like CPU load, memory load, thread pool exhaustion and load CPU load on your database. So you don't necessarily need super complicated metrics like number of jobs per second or like average amount of tasks in a job or stuff like that, that are tailored to your domain. You actually can get pretty far with these. And so that's, that's kind of the first line of defense and, and uh, in, in many services to, to catch issues early on and hold them back. Uh, and then finally, test pyramid, uh, very standard um, software engineering stuff, uh, even for distributed systems, you want a lot of uh, quick to run tests like unit tests. So I just show a, a picture of um, you know, the, the, the second one, the isolating thing. So I talked about it in the job service. Another place we've done it is in the cluster manager. So this cluster manager that, um, that uh, talks to the cloud VM API and launches clusters in each customer was also often um, you know, a, a source of failures. And in particular, one interesting reason was because these calls to the cloud API could sometimes be uh, very slow. Um, and, uh, but also, you know, it could be that doing stuff on each cluster was slow. And so 
the, the, the you know, second generation of this that we launched separates out the control logic, things like usage and billing and so on that it has to do uh, from the talking to the cloud provider and talking to the VMs. And that stuff is now sharded across these delegates. And so this stuff, your usage, billing, or ability to launch new clusters never goes down. Uh, any failures are isolated in one of these delegates. Okay. And then the final thing I wanted to just briefly talk about is evolving big data systems themselves for the cloud. Um, so it turns out, I mean, how, how you design your application has a huge impact on how easy it is to operate and to create a multi-tenant version of it and, and, and on 7,000 instances of it and so on. Um, so it turns out that actually big data systems themselves, including Apache Spark, were mostly designed when the world was on premise. And uh, you, you need to do a bunch of work to like really make them run well in the cloud and really also benefit uh, from the underlying platform, for example, from, from elasticity and so on. Uh, so we've done this in a few places. I'll talk about the Delta Lake project as an example, um, which is a, a, a way to manage storage uh, that replaces things like Apache Hive, uh, but uh, is quite a bit easier to operate uh, at scale. Um, and, uh, but we also did a lot of stuff in cloudifying Apache Spark itself, like making the scheduler know about um, elastic scaling and, and implement auto scaling and so on. So motivation for Delta Lake. So everyone wants to store data in cloud object stores because they're the largest and uh, most highly available and often most cost effective storage systems out there. So that makes sense. But the open source big data stack was designed for a team that would install and operate you know, one instance of it in one data center. Uh, and it's got a few issues, a few aspects that are different. It's got this richer API file system because it assumes that you can implement consistency within that one data center. Um, it's, it, it assumes that you're running a, a relational database for metadata, so like a Hive Metastore, because of course, if you're gonna operate HDFS, certainly you have someone on your team who knows how to operate you know, MySQL or something. Um, and also it assumes you're gonna deploy other distributed systems like Zookeeper. So when you're looking at offering this in the cloud, the, you know, these pose problems, you don't have the strong consistency there. And also we don't want to run, you know, many instances of Zookeeper or of Hive Metastore if, if we can help it uh, and keep those available because, um, uh, you know, these are you know, much harder to operate than something like S3. In S3, you just put blobs in and, and they're in there and that's it. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, lots of management burden if you want to run the old stack in the cloud. Um, so big question is how can big data systems fully leverage cloud object stores, hopefully in a simpler way than, than they did before. Um, so it turns out that the hardest problem to solve in there is actually doing atomic updates. So it's the consistency problem um, uh, without having to, to rely on these third party things like Zookeeper that you have to operate. Um, so when you run Spark on HDFS, so just as an example of an atomic update, let's imagine you, you just have a job that's writing a table. Um, it's easy to make the table appear atomically on HDFS because you just write stuff into a temporary directory and then you rename it uh, and you've got, um, uh, you've got all the data appear at once. Uh, in the cloud, if you're using something like S3, there are no multi-object operations that are atomic. So you can't rename lots of files at once or make them all appear. It's a key value store and you can only do stuff on each key value pair. So you could write a bunch of output parts as different uh, uh, objects in there, that's fine. Um, but, but you can't rename them um, after that, uh, certainly not all at once. Uh, and then there are hacks, like for example, adding a special file that says when your output is done or something. But a lot of problems can happen. Like for example, if your job fails partway through, you might be missing a file. And also because of eventual consistency, some clients might not see some of the files even though they see the dot. So it's, uh, so it's actually pretty hard to just naively use these things. And things like appending to a table or editing some of the files uh, atomically uh, are even harder to do. So in Delta Lake, we had this very simple idea. We're going to track uh, the metadata that says which objects are part of a data set. So the key value store can't, you know, it, it, it's eventually consistent, but we'll have a different 
store that tells us exactly which files are in it and are not, um, and that we can update atomically. And then this metadata that we're tracking, we're actually gonna store it in the cloud object store itself as a right ahead log. And we're gonna even compress it using Parquet to make it very fast to query the metadata for, for uh, huge tables. Uh, so that's how it works. So we have your job runs, it creates output partitions. Uh, and then there's a special uh, location called the Delta log. And we have a commit protocol that for each cloud, even though we can only do operations on one object at once, you can have a, a reliable right ahead log with serializable isolation uh, between the commits. Um, and then once you do this, you can uh, immediately, you can easily work with your data. You can do all the stuff that Zookeeper and the Hive Metastore were doing before, and it only relies on S3. So it's as highly available as S3, uh, and there's nothing extra to operate and to get paged about in the middle of the night unless S3 goes down. Um, and it's actually even faster than Hive. Um, so it made a huge impact on customers. Basically, before this, about half our support tickets were about, you know, consistency issues and errors with cloud storage. And after that, you had fewer issues and increased performance. So very cool to, to, to get that. Um, uh, this Delta Lake is now a, an open source project and it also, uh, because it provides transactions, it lets us build quite a bit more. So for example, things like time travel or caching on top or indexes that are consistent with your data uh, and, uh, or, uh, you know, or background optimization of the data. Um, and it's also changing the way that customers are building data architectures because now they have something in the cloud that looks like a, you know, like a database with asset properties and it can be used, uh, you know, you don't have to, to, to kind of step very carefully around your cloud data. You can use that, uh, you know, directly as uh, uh, for that purpose. Um, so um, uh, I'll skip some of these things, uh, but I, I did want to mention that ju just today we actually announced this SQL analytics product that is a native SQL engine specifically for Delta Lake and uh, provides query performance that's very competitive with uh, cloud data warehouses uh, and provides a SQL uh, interface, including access control with grant statements and uh, uh, access from BI tools and stuff like that. So it's, it's really, um, basically it enables you to do all, this, all these workloads directly against the cloud storage. Um, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, you know, in, in summary, the cloud is, uh, is definitely uh, providing better software products, but building reliable and large scale products there is hard. And you, you really have to rethink how you do engineering. And there are a lot of uh, kind of interesting ideas from new testing methods to designs like Delta Lake that actually minimize the amount of maintenance you have to do by design. So you rely on one super available service instead of having to, you know, to, to, to manage uh, many instances of it. Um, and uh, if you're interested in these problems, uh, we are also hiring engineers, especially on the cloud side of the house. Uh, we'd love to talk to you if you want to do that. Uh, and you can also learn more about uh, some of the uh, stuff we're doing for users at our uh, conference uh, next week. Um, so that's it. Thanks. And uh, I'm going to head into the uh, Q&A Zoom to answer questions there.